So, uh, Yuri? Yep. Just take it away. Yes, I'm taking from here. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Yuri. Uh, we're going to spend 45, 50 minutes talking about visual thinking and uh, uh, the way I usually do this, I don't do slides, I sketch as I talk about these things and you have some paper and some felt tip pens as well and it's up for you to decide would you like to sketch alone or sketch partially or just listening, that's up for you to decide but if you want to, you are free to go. And um, yeah, so visual thinking and it's a Scrum Masters community. Um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, this emergent skill set uh, in an application of how you do uh, your job and we have a lot in common, uh, me being an Agile coach. So let me tell you more about myself and uh, then I will demonstrate to you how I usually uh, communicate with people with the use of visual thinking. So I usually draw as I present stuff and right now it's about me so I'm going to draw myself. Um, a simplified version, rendering of myself. And I'll tell you a story about how I got into this and what is that I'm doing today and how does uh, visual thinking help me uh, do my job uh, better, I think, I hope. Uh, so that's me. What I am today is I'm an Agile coach. Um, and I don't know how, how to draw an Agile coach, but I would just like draw an alarmed person here. I have done some product ownership and that's what I like to do. So all in all, I spent a couple of years doing product ownership and I would just draw a person holding a box, a product. And I am a visual thinker as well. So I use visual thinking as a skill, um, as, as a complement to my, my work. But I also uh, teach other people how to apply this skill set in their professional and personal life. So that's what I call myself. Um, that's who I am professionally. I am a Ukrainian, so I'll try to draw a map of Ukraine with uh, Crimea still with this. <laughs> I'm a patriot as well. And I have moved from Ukraine to Denmark uh, in 2016, three years ago, so something like that. And right now I'm living here in Denmark. And I'm living in Denmark together with my family, my wife and my two kids. And that's me on the personal side. So what do I do professionally um, within Danske Bank? I do a lot of training and facilitation. So I spend a lot of time next to whiteboards, flip charts, playing with sticky notes and uh, helping the teams and the parts of our organization to understand how we could do our job better. So I facilitate and train. I quite often am assigned to particular teams where I, through the dialogue and through getting engaged into how they do work, um, help them, again, do their stuff better. So I do a lot of coaching and support. And um, what else do I do as a part of my um, professional profile in the organization? I try to maintain the big picture whenever I do anything. So I try to remind myself that it's not about processes, it's not about Scrum or Agile. It's about the customer, it's about our organization, our, the, this, this is a tiny icon for the bank, and the people working in it. So I just try to keep this systemic view on things to, to constantly remind myself that it's a complex setup with uh, a lot of stakeholders, us as employees being a part of that and whenever we do something we need to respect all of that. So that's me in a nutshell. 
And uh, again, um, I showed that to you through visual thinking as a rendering method to present, but you could guess that I incorporate a lot of that into how I do my job. And I'm going to demonstrate to you that it's, uh, it's a skill you can learn, regardless what you think about your drawing skills, and that it could significantly improve your job delivery, no matter what you're doing. But as I understand, most of the people in the room are Scrum Masters, with probably few exceptions. Is that so? So all the Scrum Masters, or who am I missing in terms of the role? Soren, is, you are not a Scrum Master, right? Used to be. Used to be. What do you do today? I'm a manager. And, and you? Uh, I'm a Scrum Master, but I'm also a developer. OK. Part yeah, and I would also expect that now you guys mostly are Scrum Masters, but you probably have diverse backgrounds, developers, management, business analysis, all sorts of stuff. OK, cool. Um, now let me uh, take you through the visual thinking uh, in terms of what that is, because there are a lot of uh, various understandings of what that is. But I'll just try to um, sort it out for you and myself once again. So what is visual thinking? I came up with this drawing to explain that to people who attend my courses. And I start with uh, drawing myself in the middle, seated at the table, holding a pen in my head, in my hands, sorry. <laughs> um, and drawing something on an A4, right? So that's me. Um, what we are dealing with is that the predominating communication method is the verbal language. That's the environment in which we operate. And this language is something we talk to other people or we hear something or we are listening to presentation or we are reading a book but all in all we are used to be exposed to something which is called a sequential information um, something which is a construct of a language it's a it's a chain of words that all together make a certain sense and we either read it or we hear it. Now, it's important uh, to try and explore a bit the way we think. I've been doing some reading in, uh, in that field, and I cannot say I understand everything. Neuroscience is a complex topic, but I've got to understand a few things. There are competing theories that try to explain how our brain works. But all in all, uh, where they argue, there is something that they all agree, is that there is a certain mental image or a model of the knowledge that we operate. And there are theories that they say that we code dually. We store the verbal language together with some images. Uh, there are theories that uh, say, no, it's wrong. It's only about mental uh, propositions, mental models alone. Regardless, all theories agree that uh, we operate quite a lot with the graphic information. And it's quite important as a component of information we're dealing with. So whenever information in a verbal format enters the brain, these theories agree that building the internal men mental model is quite important for our efficacy of thinking and interpretation of information. Now, if we agree to that point of view, what we could do is that whenever we are dealing with a complex information input, if we try and draw something that is close to a mental model for the information we're being exposed to. We can see that, and by engaging those parts of the brain that are responsible for the processing of the graphical information, we could make it more effective for us. Um, and I can see uh, 
through my personal experiences and still talking to other people and uh, reading um, the books on the topic, that there are certain benefits uh, that are not arguable. First is that it's much quicker to I interact with the ideas because it takes seconds for you just to draw a model of what you're thinking about or, or what you're uh, um, reading or what you're listening to and it helps you to interact with this information faster. Um, you connect on a deeper level with information uh, you are exposed to. So for example if you are in a training situation or you are in a meeting if you try to draw these things out for yourself, you understand better what is being discussed. So you are more involved, more included, and, more per, uh, and showing more participatory uh, behavior. And then uh, you definitely memorize things better. So taking notes from meetings um, helps me to keep focused on what's important because I remember those things better. They don't just evaporate from uh, my brain. And um, the last thing which is I would like to mention here, but it's quite important to me, is that I have much more fun doing my job when I do this. And I hope it's also important for you in what you're doing, having more fun. Now, um, this is in a nutshell what uh, the visual thinking is. It's about creating physically the models of the knowledge we're um, interacting with to be smarter, to have more fun, to connect better with the ideas and to memorize them better. That's how I personally use that. Um, the next thing I'm going to show you is, is something that would probably help you get convinced that this is also something that you could use yourself even if you think that you cannot draw because that is being the biggest blocker for people to start using this kind of skill in, in their professional um, uh, application because they're afraid of drawing they think like okay no way i can draw this out uh, i'd rather write these things down and there is something i call a visual thinking primer which is um, nothing more but a set of simple rules uh, that everybody can follow and following the simple rules can get you up to speed with using this skill. So the first rule goes like this. Whenever you're writing anything, you write in all capitals. Especially when you are that kind of uh, person who cannot read their own handwriting 15 minutes later it was it was put on the whiteboard um, and it's just something around a very simple alphabet so something like this a which is quick to write doesn't have serifs um, and is recognizable no matter the size uh, it's been written and uh, looks nice as well. The second rule is that you try to infuse drawings into your um, rendered models as much as you can. So use icons to make your explanations or your notes much more visual. And the icons, like for people and emotions, this is how I draw a customer. So a couple of dots, a smiley, and a circle. Um, being emotionally intelligent, capturing some quick icons about uh, what kind of an emotional state are we talking about, discussing the team state, uh, customers' attitudes, stakeholders' satisfaction, and so forth. It's drawing simplistic human, like an upside down U and a dash for a head, in order to depict a role, a person, or a group of people. And you will see I, I use these icons quite a lot, and it's simple to do. And all other types of icons, like roadmaps, knowledge, warning, risks, challenges, milestones, products, what else do I have here? 
organization, an icon of a building, um, um, code a monitor with this uh, tag here, um, agile, meaning the icon of, of Scrum, which is recognizable as an icon for agile, a target, a metric, a value, um, a credit card for payments, double arrows for processes, a laptop, a smartphone. You, you get the idea. Using very simple icons that really bring the edge to your um, explanations. Um, also learning things that would probably be uh, thought of as unrealistic for you. For example, draw faces of your team members. And I will put it like this, draw faces simply. So for example, a six-step face, a oval, eyes on that oval, eyes with a nose, the fourth step is adding a smiley, the fifth step is some ears, and final steps, eyes, nose, mouth, ears, some simplistic hair. Anyone can do that, and suddenly you can draw uh, the sticky notes for your entire team, making your visualizations personal and engaging. And then finally, uh, the fourth rule of my visual primer is that conceptualize visually what that means. That means that whenever you're talking, thinking, um, processing a complex, complex topic, um, you can use the combination of words and icons in order to create that mental uh, model of, of that situation. So, for example, you're thinking about the situation or you're discussing a situation with a team and you say, okay, now we are three people, but in two weeks from now, we will have, um, uh, I don't know, two student workers added to us. But in one month from now, meaning two more, two more weeks away from now, uh, we have this delivery. So now looking at that, you could think like, okay, do we want to spend time on onboarding these people and we still have enough time for the delivery or should we kind of focus on the delivery and uh, rethink the involvement of these people in two weeks from now? Suddenly you have a mental image of the situation that makes it easier to discuss as a group and visualize your risks and challenges. Just as an example, but it just to show you that there is nothing complex in here even if you believe you are a bad drawer. But uh, that's uh, the visual thinking primer. And the next thing we're going to do is just to, to go through some cases where I could show you how these rules could be applied. And hopefully these three cases would be uh, good enough for you to get inspired and try to experiment in, in your context when you're back to your uh, environment. Um, so those cases are two principles from the Agile Manifesto, just to get something you're familiar with, but also to show you how you could visualize this, how could you create some visual models uh, based on something complex, uh, abstract, and not necessarily clear enough. So I took two random principles, and the first one goes like, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. So the way I would visualize that, and please notice that there is no single right model for anything. Any, you could say, model is wrong, some are useful, and you could probably visualize that differently, but it's just to demonstrate the process leading to that. 
So looking at that, I would start with the customer because in my opinion, that seems to be a central figure in that statement. So it's about satisfying the customer. But how do we satisfy the customer? The clause says we need to have some early deliveries, but also a continuous process of delivery. But it should also be a valuable software. Um, usually, I go about these statements uh, as, as a timeline, because it deals with time. And I would say there is early on that time, and there is late just as an opposition to make my point. And it says, well, we need to have early delivery. So I would show uh, something delivered closer to early as opposed to late. And uh, then I would also try to address the continuous and something like more products over time, but still visually leaning toward early. And also, it says something about valuable software. And if you remember the visual thinking primer, I used um, a gem icon for the value. So I would probably circle around and draw that gem icon and say something like a value with an exclamation mark and say that this delivery Uh, and I made a typo, but that's okay, is satisfying the customer, delivery to satisfy. Now it's a bit messy, but you get the idea. And the other example is this principle here that goes like deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to shorter time scale. Here I would start thinking about two ends or two sides. We have some something that is yielding deliveries. So we have development. And then we have another side. We have market. And the market is just like a market stand, a shop stand. That creates a map to which I could reference the rest of the information. And then it says we have uh, deliveries. So we say there are some dumps of product from development to market. And it says frequently. But how can I visually uh, show that? Well, there are ways. But uh, the clause itself suggests that the frequency is quite precisely defined through the value of two, two weeks to two months or so. So I would just show the distance between the deliveries and I would say, well, maybe from two weeks uh, to two months. And then it also has something about the preference. Um, and I would use a metaphor of a slider that is <laughs> generally understood. Um, and I would say frequently on one end and rarely on another. And I would say that our preference is to push it to frequency here. Again, not the only or the right way to do this, but just to give you an idea what's the thinking behind it. And there is another example. I'm going to show you another example how you could use these tools to explain something complex. And forgive me if this is something that you cannot see anymore, but it's so good for the illustration of the method. It's the Scrum framework. And again, I'm not selling the framework to you as such. But I just want to use some sort of a common reference to make it uh, simpler to explain the method here. It's a good example of something complex that you would like to explain in a clear way and make sure that you touch the points with your team or your audience 
the way that it gives you the efficacy of such a dialogue. And visual thinking is, in my opinion, the best way to do that. So in that case, if I need to explain the intricacy of the framework, I would create an explanation something like this. I would introduce the roles first by creating a library of recognizable icons that I could reuse later on. So for example, an empty um, icon for a PO, a filled uh, icon for a Scrum Master, and a filled icon for, for the team, for the development team. I would also introduce uh, an icon for the backlog, something like uh, a box without the bottom with some homogeneous elements representing pieces of work. And that's good enough uh, to get started. And then I would introduce a timeline bent in a kind of a circle. So it's easier for me to organize the elements. And usually, I would set some precise uh, units of time. And usually, I go with uh, two weeks of time. So something like this, loosely divided in uh, five days in the first week, and then more or less precise for five days in the second week. And I would put some labels there as well, so it's easier to follow. And it's not uh, ambiguous this way. And with this setup, I have a nice map where it's easier for me uh, to start laying out different events and uh, the connection between the roles and artifacts. And this way, I could also time it with my storytelling so I could um, draw it as I explain this topic to, to, to the team or the audience, where I could start with, OK, the first event on the timeline would be a planning session. And in this session, I want a product owner, a scrum master, and the rest of the team available. And I want them to take the backlog. And I want them to start and understand how many things can fit the given timeline within the iteration in question. I want probably sometimes uh, to have some sizing exercise involved in that so we could try and estimate stuff. And other things, um, if it's important for the conversation, and I could also use the icon of time saying, well, ideally, let's try to make it short so people don't burn out and it's not a, a energy drenching for anyone. But then I would say, OK, let's say these people decided what's going to happen. I want them to do the daily check-ins with each other to understand whether this initial strategy is working and there is a progress and they could figure out how they could help each other. And I would just show that it's a regular uh, thingy and something that some people and teams call dailies, where most often it's Scrum Master with the team observing their to do uh, Kanban to do in progress done Kanban board, and maybe discussing some challenges and blockers, and timed to 15 minutes kind of event. And then in the end, I want them to, to have a review session where the team with a scrum master and a product owner and maybe some external stakeholders and some other f funny people uh, are invited if they want to see what's being developed and maybe see that on the screen, maybe touch some kind of a product if it's physical, and uh, maybe spend a couple hours for that uh, reason. And in the same day, we would like the entire team to gather and sit down for, uh, for um, an inner reflection dialogue where they could discuss what they liked and what could be improved and whatever they want uh, to change in their process uh, so it happens better next time and maybe time it to, again to one, two hours. And somewhere in between, maybe one time a sprint, maybe a couple times a sprint, 
they get to decide and again refine in the retro. Um, they might uh, want to do the refinement to understand what's, uh, uh, what's sitting on the backlog for uh, the timeline exceeding the current iteration. And again, these people will meet and will probably look into the roadmap. Maybe we'll, they will hear some customer insights and whatever is needed for them to become smarter and wiser about the next steps. And maybe again, time it to a couple hours each time. Um, it's just to illustrate that the same methods could be used to uh, explain complex topics and uh, any framework is a complex topic. And uh, you can see that it makes it a bit more digestible and more fun to, to discuss. Um, and then lastly, I would like to suggest um, an example where you could use these tools and visual thinking uh, as, as a skill set um, to look into certain processes happening um, within the team and do a kind of a systemic analysis of uh, the bigger picture outside of that. And I can, I can show you how we, we quite often do that together with my peer colleagues in Agile coaching. So let's take um, um, an example which is not from uh, a real setup. So it's uh, adjusted to avoid uh, coincidence uh, of names and products. But hopefully you could recognize something you could reuse in, in, in your situation. So let's say, let's call it like a team setup analysis. So what you usually do is that, similar to the previous example when we were talking about Scrum framework, um, you would you would start with understanding people involved. So you would say, okay, we have uh, this guy, we have this guy, we have this guy, and these are just the names. So I don't put Mary, John, and so forth. It's just the representation of, uh, of the text. And then you would say, okay, this is our team. So what, what, what do we have um, in a broader team? Maybe we have like a pro product owner or a proxy product owner or whoever. Um, and it really depends on how you draw the border. Uh, some people say, OK, we have the development team and we have a Scrum master and product owner. Some people say we, we call it a Scrum team where we uh, include everyone into the border. doesn't matter as long as it coincides with everyone else's view. Uh, but you could say, OK, this is a, our Scrum master uh, sitting here in the development team. and. Right now, our backlog is probably 57 items large. Um, we are touching these systems in order to deliver increments to, to the capabilities we are working on. And you could actually name them just like ABC and so forth. You name it. And then you could say, OK, and we are working with uh, these departments. We work with the case handlers. We work with the marketing people and someone else. And from those parts of the organization, these and these are our primary contact people. And then you could say, OK, but as far as these two systems concerned, we are dependent on other teams. So that was team A, and then team B, and team C. And team B is reporting to this part of the IT organization. This is their guy uh, who represent them. This is from. I don't know, some other part of the organization. And this is the go-to person whenever we have any conflicts or dependencies to resolve. And then right now, the product or services we're working with 
is catering for these groups of customers, like private customers, young customers, what, what, whatsoever. And then you could use this map in order to hold, let's say, a retrospective conversation where you could say, well, um, we have some challenges. So, for example, this person here um, hasn't been available in the, in the previous time and this is, this is something that led to this and this uh, problems. Or you could say, well, our major challenge is that these guys need to get up to speed with a certain technology and not being up to speed with this technology gives us all sorts of troubles because we are not developing fast enough, we are making mistakes, and what if we just buy some training? Um, or you could say, well, uh, this customer group is really dissatisfied, so it's one star out of three because it's slow, it's not reliable, and so forth. And in the bottom, we're talking about these two systems that have huge issues with, uh, with the legacy code and so forth. So it's just an example how you could uh, map out your reality with the team and use that to um, align everyone around w w what do the challenges look like and how do they systemically connect to each other so that everyone is aligned and uh, it's easier to have uh, uh, a decision about the next steps. So, that's pretty much it. Um, now we could discuss any questions you might have. Yes, please. So this tool seems quite clear, uh, at least to me, um, and simple. Um, but I'm wondering what scenarios this might be useful. Because I can see in some cases, instead of doing uh, 10 pieces of PowerPoint or whatever, you might uh, use this instead. But have you some other examples of when this could be very useful? Yeah, that's a very good question. Scenarios of use, where exactly you could apply that. Um, the first example that comes to my mind is a, a, some kind of a training situation. And if you don't do trainings as a part of your job profile, you could look at trainings as situations, for example, when a newcomer is onboarding the team and you need to explain how your process works or how the systems are set up or how these stakeholders map look, look like. And you could just you know, use a flip chart or a whiteboard and in a similar conversation, just create a representation of that uh, with a newcomer or a group of people who want to learn that so that they could see that and relate to that and ask the questions in order to go deeper into the topic. And it's, it's super effective. But again, if you do trainings, for example, I don't know, you want to train uh, the other team in Scrum framework, you could just draw it out and it will be so much more effective uh, as as compared to reading through the Scrum guides together with them. Another um, uh, scenario where you could use that is the facilitation situation. Uh, let's say you are asked by your team to facilitate uh, a retrospective with other two teams uh, around the recent delivery where you d d uh, depended on each other and it didn't work well. So what you could do is that again you could use a large whiteboard or a couple of whiteboards or whiteboard and a flip chart. Uh, it, it really depends on your ambition and the size of the problem and you could together with the team recreate what happened and draw for example the tracks like okay we delivered this this time uh, at this time and then uh, we waited for you to do this this and this but then it ping-ponged with the other team and then finally we integrated here you could actually draw the re uh, real scenario which happened in order to go away from a blaming uh, situation to uh, reflecting on what actually happened so that you could learn from that and decide how would you operate uh, in the next cycle because you still need to work together. Um, another um, uh, application of this is note taking. So you probably attend a lot of meetings, a lot of presentations where you are 
where you are getting up to speed with what's happening around you. You could use this mental models uh, drawing when you listen to the business guys presenting their ambitions and goals, listening to other teams uh, explaining their roadmaps and the intricacies of how they're going to do their part of the job, or or just listening in into the team conversation and making the, the, the notes from uh, what they're talking about in order to, to get a full picture of what's happening around you. Um, and of course, and you mentioned that yourself, uh, you could bring the presentation to the next level. So instead of you creating those slides with a lot of bullet points on each uh, page, nobody cares to listen to. Uh, let alone reading that afterwards. You could create the highlights by presenting certain visual representations of your points you're trying to make and just insert them into the, the slides and boil it down to maybe two, three slides with some major insights. And uh, because you created some clarity visually in those slides, people will want to read it and they, uh, there is a higher chance that they will understand much better what you're trying to say. So it can be anything, and it's only four areas I could uh, come up from the top of my uh, mind, but you name it, uh, it's, it's applicable in so many places. Do you have any experience using this online? Uh, yeah, online use. Um, now, if you want to kind of um, have a full um, experience of drawing, um, y you could, for example, uh, use the document camera, like I'm doing right now. So you connect it to your telepresence equipment or to Skype, and you basically explain stuff. You draw it, right? Um, and it's connected to some uh, telepresence equipment. Um, you can uh, use a tablet, for example, an iPad, and again connect it to the telepresence equipment and use uh, whatever drawing tool uh, you want to and draw directly. The downside of it is it's like a monologue situation. It's difficult to interact with this material. Uh, and recently we have been experimenting with uh, tools called uh, online whiteboards that allow collaborative effort around the artifact. And not necessarily you will draw there, but you could create virtual sticky notes and some of the tools and two uh, most popular are called Miro and another one Mural, but um, you could just create sticky notes and you could see that, okay, this is John currently working on this sticky note and typing something. This is Mary and this is a real time concurrent uh, work on the same artifact. Um, and some of the tools like Mural, for example, even suggest uh, the possibility to draw on a sticky note. But, uh, but drawing is something that gives uh, these models an edge, but not necessarily this is a critical component. Just, just explaining the complex situation through the number of sticky notes might be all you need uh, to have. So depending on the situation, you could choose the method of uh, uh, doing that uh, with the remote participants. So this could be a collaborative uh, side of it. Okay, good question. And if I can just pitch to that, I think also online sharing pictures of your drawings, actually just drawing, using pen and paper and just taking pictures and, and start sharing them is actually uh, something that's worked well for me. Yeah, so you basically draw it in your notebook, for example, physically, I mean, then take a picture with your smartphone and then just email it to your colleague. It works like a charm. Yes, it's a bit of a, you know, of a, uh, of a workaround in a way, 
but sometimes it saves so much effort and time for you just to express something complex because you just drew it quickly, send it maybe even directly to their mobile number and then having a dialogue around it. Uh, I used something else as well. I, uh, there was a complex situation when I needed to explain an approach to a workshop where, where I was asked to facilitate and it was so difficult and I couldn't reach the guy to, to have a conversation over Skype. So what I did, I, I just took my uh, iPhone and I explained that on a paper and I, uh, and I just captured the video and I sent the video. And then a guy called me the next day because he was in a different time zone and he said, a few questions to that, but other than that, it's okay. So, you know, you could create a video in a very low fidelity way, just capturing your thoughts uh, in, on a video. Anyone? Yeah, please. Yeah, I notice you only use uh, monocolors or red. Uh, I use uh, more colors and I use shadows and highlights when I have time to gold plate, but I just did not have time for that and uh, the way I do that is when I have time like right now with all the information spilled out on the paper I could use uh, highlighters um, for, for example to uh, to create some um, uh, emphasis on what's important and beautify it through application of shadows it's something I call turn um, models uh, into Instagrammable artifacts because they look, you know, they look fancy, sexy, and you can send it uh, uh, on some social media and get a lot of likes. But I would only do that when I have time because otherwise uh, it would be awkward if you had to wait for me to, you know, to spend time on that. But I do use that. It really depends on, on the later use of the artifact. If I needed to explain something, I would just focus on the essence of the idea, right? Because the time is important in, in that aspect. But I do beautify things. It just, you need to find <laughs> a good balance, right? Yeah, but uh, yeah, I do that, I do that. Thank you for your interest and your time. I hope you liked it. Okay, cool.